All right, um, we're gonna start the recording. So my name's Pat Wright. We'll be talking about speaking and community involvement for the introvert tonight. Um, this is at the uh, Postgres users group for, C I mean, for Salt Lake City. And we'll just get started here. The presentation that I'm gonna give tonight is pretty much about, it's kind of broken into two parts. The first part is really talking about community, why you should be presenting, what you should be looking for, and some of the things to do for the introvert side of things. And then the second part will be the actual task of getting a presentation ready, what you should do, how you should prepare for it, slides, um, how you should get ready, all the different things around that. That's what we'll talk about second half of it. So we'll get started here. All right, so first things first, always have an about me slide in your presentations. Um, make sure that you tell about yourself inside here. Make sure you give contact information for um, how they can get a hold of you. If you have the slides already shared out somewhere, it's a great idea to put a link to those slides already here. I'm also a big fan of something like a picture on there. This way, if somebody's watching the presentation later on, they'll be able to see that and they'll know, they'll know exactly who I was and who they were speaking to. Um, this is me. I've been working with databases now for about 15 years. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work with Utah Geek Events. Um, I take a lot of photos and I do photography on the side and you're gonna see some of those pictures tonight in this presentation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them too as well. If you wanna get a hold of me, you can reach me on Twitter at SQL Asylum or you can reach me at email on SQLAsylum at gmail.com. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. so. Why is presenting and community involvement so important to what you're doing? Why does it really, really matter for you to be out in the community, out there presenting, or just, you know, networking with other people? I love Simon very much for this um, quote and for many of the things he says, but for this quote too, people don't buy what you do, they buy what, why you do it. This is really important to me because they want to hear why you are doing something. Why are you passionate about it? These two pictures that you see here are both uh, have wonderful stories behind them. Um, I love to take pictures. I love photography. It's very passionate for me. And it takes me a lot to get to these places to do this. The one on the left is called the crack in Zion National Park. This is only obtainable through the subway. The subway is a backcountry adventure hike and it's only given out 50 permits per day. And I've done this now twice in my life. Um, and I've fallen both times <laughs> and hurt myself several times doing this. And it was a killer hike and it almost killed me, but I got the picture I wanted and I spent the time and I took the passion to do it. It's the same with when you're presenting is you have to have passion for presenting, for doing it and give a good reason for why you are doing it. If you're doing it just to fulfill a class requirement, or if you're doing this just because, you know, hey, um, my boss told me to or something like that, that's not really why you should be doing it. You should be doing it because it will impact your career and make all the difference as you move forward in your career. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The second picture here is, is a little tiny waterfall. And right after I took this picture, I went to jump back across the river and I fell and I hit my head. And then my glasses went down the river and I never saw them again. <laughs> so I ended up walking back the entire a mile and a half trek with my sunglasses on. Uh, that was, uh, that's one of the only reasons I kept this waterfall picture. I don't really love it or anything, but it's one of those times that it's like, yeah, you'll never forget what you were doing when you took that picture. So I bring that up and I love to show that picture in this presentation because it's another one of those passion things that are very important to you. So, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so now, how do you get into this whole presenting thing? And again, we're gonna talk more and more about details and technicals of it, but there's no more important thing than this thing right here. This little statement of 20 seconds of courage. And I'll tell you where I got this from, and not the meme, the meme's just a meme, but I got this saying from the movie called I Bought a Zoo. And I believe it's Brad Pitt is in that movie. And, or no, no, uh, it's a uh, uh, Goodwill hunting guy. I forgot his name now. Matt Damon. <laughs> Matt Damon, thank you. Um, so he tells his kids that it took me 20 seconds of courage to walk across the 
aisle to your future mom and meet her and say hello so that I could have this wonderful life that I've had so that I can marry her and everything else. It took me 20 seconds of courage to come up with that idea to just walk over and to change my life forever. And I tell you this now because it takes 20 seconds of courage for you to submit a presentation. It takes 20 seconds of courage for you to raise your hand and say, yes, I'll present. And the most important thing you can do is that 20 seconds to just say to yourself, I just have to do that step. So Brennan, who's on this call, actually wrote me earlier today and he says, how do I get around the social anxiety of doing some of these things? How do I get around that I don't want to be out in these crowds and everything else doing these things? I'll tell you right now, most people in the technical community are introverts. You are not alone. I will even say that Ben is on many occasions, and so am I, um, that we don't really want to be with huge crowds of people but we find it that 20 seconds of courage and that small amount of time for us to pause the introverts and to say, we know that this will do better for us in our career. So we take that small amount of time and we say, okay, we got to do this. And then we go and relax <laughs> and then we hide or we go and isolate or we say, okay, I'm going to go and watch a movie for the next three hours or something. I'm going to stay away from people. But that 20 seconds of courage makes all the difference in the world. And the other story to this one is how I became the only, the only database guy to run a Microsoft code camp. <laughs> so, and Ben kind of knows this story because he was somewhat there at the beginning is, um, I was a Microsoft MVP uh, way back in 2007. And we were on an MVP call. MVPs are members of the community that help and support the community uh, uses groups and presents and presentations. And one of the uh, regional directors said, we need to have a code camp. <laughs> and there was about 15 other MVPs on this call, but I was the only one that raised my hand and said, I'll do it. <laughs> and that was my 20 seconds of courage. And I said, sure, I'll run an event. I had no idea how to run an event. I had no concept of what to do. I didn't know how to get presenters, speakers, anything. But the first Utah code camp was born way back in 2006 to 50 people. That event now is Big Mountain Data and Dev in the fall, and we currently have over 800 people that attend it, and we've now run that event. I've done that event probably 25 times in my life now, and for a time, we even did it twice a year. That all started with one simple thing like, yep, I'll do it. It was less even of a thought and more of just, let's do it. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's one of those times that you just sometimes have to say to yourself, 20 seconds of courage will do everything to change your life. And what do I mean here about changing your life? And what do I mean here about how does it really impact you? I can tell you right now, without question, that because of my presentations, because of my presence in the community and all the different work I've done, I have an interview for a job in over 10 years. I really haven't. I haven't. I go to lunch with some people. We talk about something. We say, hey, you know, would you like to come and work at our site? Or, hey, I've got this really cool project. I think you'd be really interested. You should take a look at it. That's what networking and, and presentations do. They put you up there as the expert and you are networking with other people, finding out what's out there. So you get the chance right there to get those positions that come up. And I can speak to this again, Ben, same thing. Ben was referred originally to the company he works at right now by me because, and there wasn't a huge interview process or anything else. I'm like, I know Ben, great. I know him well. I've seen him present. I know him talk. He's a master at what he does. There's no question. Let's, let's get him in here. So it's things like that that really make a difference in your career when you're out there doing those things. I've only been laid off once in my life. And right after I was laid off, I was you know, looking at jobs and only a week later. And I had plenty of things lined up all because I had a community and a network to work with. So it makes all the difference in the world being out in the community more than anything else. So um, keeping some drinks going here so I don't lose my voice, but uh, any questions right now, just kind of talking about this and the passion and the drive, anything that I mentioned here that you, you want to add to or anything you want to contribute. I was just going to say that uh, 
back in the day when you did that, um, when I was in Utah between 2003 and, or 2002 and 2006, um, Pat was awarded MVP. I awarded him for his offline contributions. He was one of the first MVPs to ever be awarded for not doing online stuff. And, uh, it was mostly around his passion toward events and speaking and doing things that helped people in the local community, which was a new thing for Microsoft to do. But, um, but that, that's what it took is, is, is the drive and the willingness to share, help people. And it, it all came to be, it was really cool. Yeah. And, and again, don't think of me as some sort of superstar that I, 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 you know, knew everything I was doing. I absolutely did not. Again, Ben and I were just talking about my first presentations in 2004 and 2005. I was a terrible presenter, really horrible. I mean, I've gotten bad reviews and everything else. You have to improve yourself. Don't, don't ever think that you're going to walk up on the stage and you're just going to be perfect right out of the box. You're not. That you have to improve and that's what you have to do. But raising your hand to do it is the most important thing. And you have to keep in your mind the end goal. The end goal is that in the future, your career benefits so much more from just doing that simple thing of presenting. And yes, it's difficult, but it will make all the difference in the world presenting and being part of the community more difference than I say, than many of the technical things you could do instead. I mean, don't get me wrong. You have to know your stuff. You have to be good at what you do. But um, I will say many times that I'd get a lot more opportunities um, knowing people in my community than having five certificates behind my um, name. So, and I don't have that many certificates behind my name. So thank you, Ben. Um, so the important thing in a presentation is this right here. <laughs> once upon a time, um, once upon a time, we watched Lord of the Rings. Now we're not going to do that tonight, but it is very important that when you start to do presentations, start to work on a story. And the reason I say that is because people remember stories. I've already told several stories in this, in this presentation right now. And you're going to remember those stories much more than you're going to remember the facts that I put on the slides. A perfect example is, and I don't know, if Brendan, if you saw this part, but I was just speaking to the University of Utah's um, data science class, and I told them a story about how I crashed a production database. And this was just a few years ago. I, I, I destroyed the uh, database, the whole thing, lost the entire thing. We had to restore from backup everything. It happens to the best of us. But that story really, several of them sent me a message saying, wow, I didn't think that anybody would ever tell something like that or talk about how bad that was for them, yet they made it out and they didn't get fired or anything else. And I'm like, yes, we have to talk about these things. You remember the stories. You remember those key things. So make sure you tell a story in your presentations. And to add another one to this one right now is this all started um, we go back again to the code camp and everything else, but I was also at a, a past summit. That's a SQL Server summit way back in Florida in 2006. And I was going to that summit with the intent of coming out of my shell. <laughs> I knew I had to speak to more people. I knew I had to be part of the community more. And so I knew that I had to talk to the people next to me. But I'm like, I don't know what to talk about. I'm an introvert. I'm a shy person. I'm like, I don't know what to talk to the person next to me. But luckily, I realized, hey, we're in the same session. So obviously, we're both very interested in this presentation. Maybe this other person next to me is interested in the same thing I am, in the internals of SQL Server. We were watching Kimberly Tripp in the internals of SQL Server. And I just turned to him and I said, hey, what are you excited about this presentation? And his name happened to be Thomas LaRock. And Thomas LaRock went on to become the past president and a great volunteer and a great friend. I've now known him for well over 15 years and we still talk to this day and he's just an awesome person and those sort of friendships that you make at a conference or at a users group or anything else just by starting that little conversation can last forever um, they can lead to jobs they can lead to careers they can lead to all sorts of things all because you did one little thing of um, talking to the person next to you and whenever somebody says to me well i don't know what to ask them i'm like you're in the same room you got to be interested in the same thing because you're watching a session together. So just ask them about the session. Ask them if this is a great presenter or if you heard the presenter before. It can be any simple thing. Just get it started and then it will go from there. 
Okay, questions on telling a story. Hey, Pat, I got a, a different question kind of related to, to your last thing, because I do remember you talking about the, those stories. Um, for me personally, I think I, I overthink it a lot. I mean, I'm not particularly social and I overthink a lot of situations. So I don't know if you or maybe anyone else has any comments on how to avoid doing that. Absolutely. Um, again, on the overthinking side of things, if you're in a session with somebody else, start it simple. Why do you like this session? Nothing more than that. You know, why do you like the session? What, in, what are you interested in the session? Keep them simple topics. Once you get a conversation going, you can usually keep it going just by asking simple questions. So there's a very simple phrasing of just keep asking simple questions. You don't have to necessarily um, come up with what is the, you know, a logarithm that you find most, you know, important to use in data science. It doesn't have to be compelling. It just has to be a discussion so that you can start talking. Um, anyone else have any other suggestions? So in person and at big events where there's a lot of people, I get, I, I'm like stereotypical clumsy geek. One thing I've found to help me break the ice is just lean into that, crack a joke, you know, some self-deprecating humor. It leads to a conversation whether I intend on it or not. Uh, so if you're just having fun with yourself, like that energy is a lot of times contagious and sometimes other people will even break the ice for you because, you know, you're the goober that just tripped on the <laughs> yourself Ooh. or whatever. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, excellent. Yep. Anyone else want to add? Okay, and I will say too, at a large conference or an in-person conference or anything else like that, if you are into the liquid libation side of things, it's definitely helpful something at night. If you're at an evening party or something, it's a lot easier because you might have a few drinks and then you're a little more relaxed about what you're doing. Um, so that is something that you can think about too as well. Again, that's not for everybody. I'm just making the suggestion that sometimes that helps. Um, most of our community work was done later at night at usually evening events um, at, pre at conferences and stuff. Okay, so I want to wrap this summary side up of really what I wanted to talk about here. And that's why I kind of made this, this summary slide here. And I wanted to point out a few more things on here too as well. <laughs> Number one, um, I really, really suggest this book to anyone that's out there looking to try to get into presenting or anything really. I, I find this book has helped me through life on just about everything I do. It's called Change Anything. It's made by the same people that made Influencer, and it really teaches you about how you should really look at things and see a good path for trying to change some of your habits. Again, I'm not telling anybody that they have to stop being an introvert, an introvert for, or and you can't just stop having social anxiety. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that you can pause and you can do certain things to help yourself out. Books like this help with that a lot. They give you a lot of great ideas of the little steps you can do to change your behavior so that it gets a little better. Um, it is not easy. Please understand, nothing I'm saying is an overnight switch. It is very much a time-consuming process that you have to do. It takes time. So when you start on your presentation, though, always start with your why. Why are you giving the presentation? Always start with passion, meaning the, whenever someone says to me, what should be the first thing I present on? I say, what are you most passionate about? Whatever you are most passionate about, you should present on. They're like, well, but I don't know that much about that topic. I'm like, you will learn when you present on it and you will learn um, information about it. And because you're passionate about it, it will show. If you are passionate about something, it will show in your presentation, I guarantee it. If you are not passionate about it and you have to present on it, it doesn't look good. I've done it, it's not fun. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about some of the features they dropped out of SQL Server that I presented on and they never made it to light of day. That was terrible. Um, so tell a story, um, like I mentioned there. If you YouTube David Phillips, David Phillips is one of my, my favorite speaking coaches on how to do things. He tells stories like nobody else. And if you watch his presentations, it is pretty amazing. So if you can study and, and look into what he has on YouTube, it's really wonderful. Um, pause the introvert. We already talked about that. And willpower is not the answer. Do not tell yourself that you just have to be stronger at something. Kind of like what you're mentioning, Brennan, that you overthink something and you just say, well, I can just grip my teeth and do it. 
That's not the answer. You have to find a way that works for you. And that's something that Change Anything talks about a lot. They don't want you to just grit your teeth and try to get through it. They want you to find a way that actually works for your thought process. And that's all about changing your habits and what you do. And then my final thing here is just that I really like the idea of life's a journey. You should enjoy it. So if you are having a great time doing it, then it's even better, right? I mean, we should all have a good time. We only have one life, so let's live it well. Okay, questions on some of these steps. Um, after this, we'll kind of get into some of the details of presentations and some of the finer points of what, what's needed. <coughs> All right, so what should you do when you actually submit a session? So <laughs> most of what I'm gonna talk about here is going to relate to in-person conferences or conferences of some sort of kind. Um, many of the conferences are still virtual right now. We're gonna be having one later this year. Big Mountain Data and Dev will be coming up in the, in the fall in October. Um, SQL Saturdays, uh, Postgres conferences, whatever they are, most of them have something similar to the abstract process I'm gonna talk about here. So a lot of this will apply to all the same things. Um, submit multiple sessions. <laughs> now, this doesn't mean you're going to do multiple sessions, although if you're my friend Randy, <laughs> so my friend Randy submitted to SQL Saturday one year, and Ben knows this, and we took all four of his sessions. He submitted four sessions, and we took all of them and made him present all four sessions in, in I think, one day. <laughs> so, yeah, it was kind of cruel of us, but we needed the filler. We need the sessions. So, normally, you will not get all of your sessions accepted. It is so that you give the organizers the most possibilities of things that they could take from yours. I always suggest at least two. Sometimes three is a good idea as well. Um, it just really depends on what you're going for and the size of the conference. Um, funny enough, though, I did this with New York Postgres Conference right before uh, last year in March, which got canceled right for coronavirus. And I submitted three topics and I really only expected one because it was a rather large conference. Yeah, they did end up picking up all three. I was going to do all three of the presentations. And I was like, um, okay, did I really need to get three? I'm not that well known or anything, but I was going to do them. So always submit multiple sessions. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> check your grammar, proofread it, spell check it, give it to someone else. I give it all to my kid. He is a Nazi when it comes to grammar. And I say, here, read this and make sure it works. Um, make sure it looks good. I am not good at it. So make sure you do that, though. It is important for people looking at it to make sure they see that quality of work. I always like to say you want to put in your descriptions and your abstracts who your audience is. Don't just say, you know, this is a presentation on Postgres indexes and how to index them. I mean, how to properly um, deal with bloat. No, say this is for the developers to teach you how to use proper indexing and DBAs to learn how to manage bloat inside Postgres. It's a much better description because it tells you a lot more about who actually wants to be sitting there. A lot of the times in your presentation, you're not going to get bad remarks from the people that want to be there. You're going to get bad remarks from someone that read your description and said, this wasn't what I expected. And it was because of your description that they're in the wrong place. So try to make your description really um, descriptive to what you want them to be. If you get somebody in your class that said, this was completely not the session I wanted, that's really a problem with your abstract more than anything else. It's not really theirs. It's they read their abstract. They thought of something and you completely went the opposite direction. <laughs> Make a short, clear summary. Um, these are good for the titles, things that are on the page that show up quickly. Um, there's a lot of talk. Should you make it gimmicky? Should you make it a, something that somebody can get into? Basically, you want it somewhat descriptive. Um, don't go too gimmicky or too, you know, um, cute cute uh, inside joke sort of thing, because if you have new people in the community, they may not know those jokes. Okay, so be descriptive, but don't go too far and don't make it too complicated to understand. Um, questions on abstracts? Okay, so one of my favorite slides, and 
<laughs> I might have to call you out on this one, Ben. I've uh, done this presentation now like five or six times, and I think I've called you out on it, and you've never been in my session for it. <laughs> That's how it so, works. <laughs> so demo, if you are doing a demo, I cannot stress enough how much you need to test your demo beforehand, OK? Um, the perfect story of this is both, well, both Randy and Ben. Uh, Randy had a really great presentation. And like I said, he had been doing four of them. And he had been doing these all across the country, too. So he had done a lot of these demos before. Well, the morning of, he ended up getting a Windows update and his entire demo broke. And he had to rewrite his whole demo by the afternoon session to get it working again, to get it tested. Now, luckily, he tested it that morning, so he knew that it was going wrong and he could spend the time to fix it and correct it. But sometimes <laughs> demos don't go well during the session. <laughs> so Ben had this problem. He had one of his demos go bad and unfortunately tried to clear it out. Um, remove it and unfortunately removed a little too much <laughs> and the demo didn't go too well after that. So um, make sure you test your demos as much as possible. Make sure you practice them as much as possible and try to test them right before your session, if at all possible as well. And make sure you have friends that don't tweet, <laughs> shift, delete, you know, <laughs> hashtags. Yes, after you, yes. After you blow your demo. <laughs> yeah, make sure you're, I'm not in your presentation. I definitely gave Ben a lot of crap for that, but I still love you. Um, and, and do have a backup though, too. I mean, that's the other important thing is, is that if something goes wrong in your demo, have some sort of backup. Now that backup could be a video that shows the demo working. It could be just uh, screenshots of the demo, something like that. It can be something to do and deal with that. If you're doing a demonstration and it goes wrong, if it goes bad, it's very, very important that you apologize once and you move on. Do not spend all of your time trying to fix the demo or trying to take care of it or um, trying to do something to correct it because everybody will fixate on that. Um, we had one presenter that just went in there and just kept apologizing over and over and over again for the demo going bad. And people gave him bad remarks just because they're like, we, we're, we're fine with the demo. We just wanted to keep going, but we didn't get to learn anything else because they just kept going on the demo. So you can't let it end your presentation. You just got to move forward and keep going. Okay. Um, questions on demos or any other suggestions? You mean you're not going to say anything about typing in demos? <laughs> so typing in demos, that, that's an excellent point. I love that, that you brought that up, Ben, because I was a full person that would say never type in a demo. I love to copy and paste. I love to use little shortcuts. I love to do that. And I have met very few people in my life that can truly type in demos and just code on the fly. I've met several more now at the current company I work at. There's like several of them that do it very well. So... I'm starting to get a, around to this a little bit more, but I still am a person that I like to copy and paste. Like if you see me do a coding demo or something else, you will see me paste in the commands for each thing that I need to have done. So anybody else? Questions? Okay. All right, so <laughs> here's the real secret. Here's my day of prep. This is what I do before every presentation. All of those bottles are gone before every presentation. I'm totally joking. Um, I do love this picture because it's me prepping for a party, not for a presentation. So day of prep, make sure that you confirm with your organizers. If you're doing a virtual meeting like this, like if you're doing a user group or something else, myself or some other organizer should email you and say, hey, is there anything else you need? Do you know the Zoom meeting? Do you know where to go to get this information? Um, if, you're, <coughs> if you're presenting in person, make sure you find your room, make sure you know what time that you are scheduled for, and make sure you check your time right when you get there, because organizers have to schedule, I mean, shift the schedule sometimes. It comes up, all sorts of things happen. I have put on way too many conferences, and I have yet to put on a conference where I didn't have someone cancel a day before the event. And so when that happens, you have to shift schedules. And so make sure you check in with the organizer and say, what's going on? Are we in the same room? Are we in the same schedule? Go to the room and test it out. Test your demo there if you can, if you can do it in between sessions, or if they have a green room, you can do testing and stuff like that in, in there. 
Um, drink lots of water, not only when you're sick, but you should be drinking it all the time. <laughs> Do not drink sugary sodas. Um, energy drinks are something that you can choose or coffee or something else or a tea. Um, if you feel like you need to pick me up for the caffeine side of things, that's fine, but make sure it's not a heavy sh sugary soda. They will make it much, much harder for you to talk and you don't want that. You wanna keep water. Um, a lot of people have suggested a hot tea is really good for your vocal cords as well too. I've heard that several times or a hot water um, right before. Um, I haven't tried that myself, but that's one that's been suggested to me several times. Honey and is then, also a good one. Yeah, honey is a good one. Um, again, maybe warm, just not too much. Again, you don't want anything gumming up. Like if you've got a, if somebody said, let's go drink a Dr. Pepper before something, I'd be like, no, no way. Cause you'll get completely gummed up from that. Cause you, you are going to be talking for 45 to 60 minutes, most likely. So definitely think about, you know, what you're going to drink during that time. Okay. Any other questions on day of prep? Uh, I've got something to add though. If, yes. if your presentation is like first thing in the morning and you like before you've casually spoken with other people, talk to yourself for a few minutes to warm up your voice or Great talk idea. to somebody in the audience because I, <laughs> I don't have a voice in the morning. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. Excellent suggestion. Yes, that would be great. If you are if you are the morning person or the morning event, um, make sure you're talking to someone so that you get some conversation in before you get started. Excellent. Okay. So some of the communities that are out there that are available to you to do things like this, some of the presentations that you can go and do and all of these are in all these other places. Obviously, Meetup has a bunch. We're the Salt Lake City Postgres, and hopefully in the future, you will consider presenting at the Postgres users group. But there are also the SQL Server users group, and there's the Python users group, and there's the data, um, you, I mean, the Big Data Utah users group. There's a ton of users groups. Whether you're in Utah or anywhere else, they're everywhere. Meetup is your best friend. Just look for SLC Tech in, in meetup.com and you'll find tons and tons of groups. So something that you're passionate about will be out there and you'll have the ability to present. I can tell you right now, because I run two or three of these groups, we all need presenters. We always need presenters. We're not going to turn you away. Even if you say, well, I've never presented before, they'll be like, great. How much time do you want? What would you like to do it on? And let's talk about it. They'll absolutely help you do it. It's the great place to get started. Um, technology focused groups is pretty much the same thing if it's just a specific technology. <coughs> Slack, we have our Slack community on Utah Geek events so that you can find um, different people you want to talk to. If you wanted to converse about a session coming up or anything else like that, you can talk to me on there or you can talk to anybody else in the community and say, hey, I'm interested to present on this. We have lots of people in the Slack community that you can talk to. And then our newsletter, our Utah Geek Events newsletter announces all of our new events coming up. Um, Big Mountain Data and Dev will be coming up in the fall, like I said, and our call for papers will be opening up pretty soon. So if you're interested in presenting at that, that's a great one to do. We're probably gonna have over 60 to 65 different sessions going on at that event. So it's a wonderful place to go and present. Okay. Some of the things for presentation time. Some of the key things that you need to know there, don't worry about I don't know, meaning you can say I don't know. One of the biggest problems everyone has with presenting is saying I don't know or saying I am scared to present because I will not have the answer to every question that is asked me. Let me make it 100% clear. You will not have the question to every, I mean, you will not have the answer to every question that is asked of you. It's that simple. Someone else in the audience is going to know something more than you are. It's just going to happen, especially in your first few presentations. There's nothing wrong with that. That just means that that's something for you to learn. When you start presenting, one of the best things you do with presenting is that you start to learn more about the topic. Um, ben and I used to talk about this all the time. If you want to learn about something, if you want to learn about Ben is an expert in PowerShell. If you want to learn about PowerShell, present on it. If you want to learn about Postgres, present on it. Present some topic about it, and you have to learn about it. So it's a great way to learn. Just don't be afraid of saying, I don't know. When you say, 
I don't know, say, I don't know. Let me write that down and follow up with you later and I'll see if I can find that answer. And do diligence and write it down. I keep a book right here next to me whenever I do a presentation to write down suggestions from other people. I try to follow up or I try to post a blog post or something else saying, I learned about this thing in one of my presentations because someone asked me this question. That will make you better. That's what you should do anytime you say, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> So please do not think that you cannot do it just because you're gonna get a question that you don't have the answer to. Trust me, you're gonna get a question that you don't have the answer to. I mean, my first several years of presenting, I didn't know half of the things that were asked of me, but then I learned over time and I could start answering those questions. Um, repeat the question. This is one that I haven't been doing very well on this presentation. I usually am pretty good about this, but um, I, it was a much smaller audience, so I haven't been doing it, but definitely repeat the question. This is not only good for the recordings and so everybody can hear it, but also just in the audience, everybody then knows what the question was. Because if you're in a bigger room or if you can't hear in the back of the room, it's better to repeat so that everybody knows what was said. <coughs> All right, be comfortable. This is a big one. Um, a lot of people say to me, well, should I be in a suit when I come to the presentation? Do you normally wear a suit? No, then you shouldn't be in a suit. <laughs> you should be in what you are most comfortable in. I don't mean a bathrobe and slippers or something like that, but I mean something that you would normally wear that keeps you comfortable. You should be up here comfortable, okay? Do not wear some sort of brand new tight pants, tight shirt, something else that you're not comfortable in or gonna not sit in for the next couple hours because you're gonna be there. So be comfortable. That's very important. <coughs> Um, plug in your computer. Um, this is kind of a common thing that a lot of people are like, well, my Mac can go for like six hours without dying and stuff like that. And I'm like, yes, you're right. It can. But did you know that when you unplug your laptop, it also likes to go to sleep on different settings. So as you're scrolling through your slides, it's going to go to sleep on you and you don't realize it. So just plug it in. <laughs> it's the best thing for you. Um, this one, you know, you'll balance this sometimes if you don't plug it in at least turn off your auto sleep settings and stuff like that. I call this eyes up and on your audience, but really it's engage your audience. You have noticed here that I have been standing this entire time. I like to stand and talk. Even if I'm at a desk right now, I'm going to stand and talk because I like to engage my audience. I like to keep my eyes on the camera and try to do my very best to engage the audience. So when you are doing this in person or on virtual, make sure that you are up and looking at them. Do not hide behind your computer. It's okay if you do a demo or something else and you type a few things, but then stand back up and talk. Make sure you project and you talk. Um, the more you are engaged with your audience, the more it's going to make a difference. If you hide behind a podium or you hide behind a screen and they can't see you, they're not going to listen to the presentation at all. So make sure you engage with them. And then active, keep things moving. I use a... Uh, um, <laughs> When I'm on stage, I use a simple technique called blocking, just like they do in the theater or anything else. When I'm on stage, I pick two points of reference that I always know where I'm at. And I do this before I get started. I know exactly where the two boxes are. So I know I can walk from right here to right here and I can still look at you and talk and I can move around and I can do things, but I'm not gonna fall off the stage because I know that these two spots are good. I won't move anywhere else. I won't go way over here or anything else, but I will stay in those spots. And by just doing that every once in a while and just changing up my position, it helps keep you engaged with me. Um, again, that's a technique that I use. It's taken a long time to get to that point. You don't have to do that at first, but you should be always up and engaged um, for sure, even if you don't move around. Okay, questions or other comments from the other presenters on this one? Got a question actually mm -hmm. on keeping people engaged. Um, I, personally, I like the style of having the audience be able to ask questions as you go, but when you have a larger audience, how do you balance that, that Q and A and that interaction? So I still do, and I will frequently, and I didn't do it this time, but I will frequently at the beginning of my presentation say, please interrupt me as I go. I would like this to be as much of a discussion as possible. Um, 
I believe that you should ask questions all the way throughout the same thing. Even in a large setting, you should do that. The only time that I see it as a large setting that you can't do that is if you do something like a keynote where you can't really answer questions or anything. But if you're, even if you're in a room of say, 100 people, as long as questions can come up um, at different times, then you should still be able to handle them and go through. The important part is knowing when to stop necessarily and move forward on those questions. You have to keep your session moving. So sometimes you have to say, that's an excellent question. I really love that question. Let's talk about it more afterwards. I have to keep going on my session. So that's what I suggest around that. Okay, cool. Any other questions on this one? Okay, online suggestions, if you're doing anything online, share the actual app you need. So anytime that someone has to, you know, do something <coughs> where they have to download or anything, make sure they have the information beforehand, make sure it's in a slide here that they can take a QR code or something else like that. Um, I added this really just since the pandemic and sort of thing. And then have someone help and take questions. Like if you're doing a Zoom presentation like this and there was 30 people in here and we couldn't just easily unmute and we had a chat window going, we would have a, a mediator would basically help to take those questions and stuff. Larger conferences are doing that for you right now or they're giving you a moderator that answers those questions and asks them. Um, do have a decent virtual background. Um, just don't have anything too distracting really is what you should go for. Um, we made the joke today. We, we had the Wizard of Oz playing behind us and stuff, the big fire and brimstone, and it distracted a whole bunch of people that were in our um, uh, big conference call today. And that was more of a joke. We were doing it for fun. I would never do it in a presentation like this because obviously it is distracting and that's not what you want. Okay. <laughs> uh, feedback and follow-up. So. This is kind of one of the more important ones. And, and really, I, I mentioned the blog about it, the follow-up of the attendees, but there's no more important thing than the last statement right here. Put your armor on. So as soon as you stand up and present, you must be willing to take criticism because you are not going to please everyone. It's that simple. It's not going to happen. And the hardest part of putting on any conference is not leading up to it but it's the Sunday after the conference. The Sunday after the conference, I sit down and I read our feedback from that conference. And that is the toughest day for any conference for me. Because as an organizer, I have to take every one of those feedbacks and say, okay, how can I make this better? And I have to take everything that comes in, no matter what it is. So you've gotta be ready to take those licks and be able to say, okay, I can make myself better because of this. Now, hopefully they left you constructive feedback. They left you things that said, I really didn't like how you're moving around so much. I'd really appreciate if you would just sit down and relax or something like that. That's feedback you can work on. If they just said your session sucked, unfortunately, there's nothing you could do with that. But do try to leave feedback and do understand that you're going to have to take that feedback whenever you start presenting. You're gonna have to get feedback. So just get ready, put your armor on and <laughs> do your best and taking that. Do try to always take it. Do not take it. I mean, it's hard to say don't take it personally, but in other words, you have to improve. Again, I, for the first several years of presenting, I was a terrible presenter. I just read slides perfectly. I, I only had these few bullet points. I didn't tell any stories. It was quite boring, really. And I got some good feedback finally that told me about that. And then that was how I improved. You're not going to improve until you get that feedback. So don't be afraid of it. Just understand that it's coming. It will always come. Um, follow up on any questions you had or any follow-ups like in the hall or anything else. Make sure you follow up. Or if you can blog about it, that's a great way for you to increase your own network in the future as well. Okay. Any questions on feedback follow-up? No, just another comment too about the feedback. I being being introverted, you don't like to hear anybody say that you did bad or <clears throat> or you did you did not so well as as you thought you did or or whatever. But the the main thing really is I try to prepare in the beginning. I try to prepare the audience to understand how to give feedback so that when they do fill the feedback out or while they're listening to your presentation, they can actually give constructive feedback where they don't just say, I hated this presentation and that was the end of story. Well, then you can't do anything with that. You just kind of 
put that aside and, and you're always going to have a hater. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. The bigger the audience, the more percentage you're going to have a hater. And, and you just, you, you do have to have your armor on and understand that you know where you're at. They don't, they don't know how long you took to present the, or to prepare. And they don't know how long you've been doing this, but you do. So you take that into consideration, understand that they said, I really didn't like the colors you had on your slide. It really hard to read. That's really good feedback. Cause you can change that. that those are things you can change and, and, and anything else they give you um, try to find it, find it from their perspective um, as if you were sitting in the audience and then make those changes. Don't, don't just take the feedback and then keep doing the same thing um, because that's how you don't get better. And that's how you don't advance. And, and the whole point of this is to, is number one, to get better yourself, but number two, to, to help the attendees get more out of your session. So nothing's wrong with feedback. I, I used to hate it because I wasn't good either. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's hard to hear, but, but now I, I can't wait to get my feedback forms. I, I can't wait to see what little thing I missed, what, what did I do weird, what did I do different, what could I do better? And it, it's fun actually now, I, I, other than the ones that just don't really care to give, give you constructive <laughs> yeah. feedback. Yes. Excellent points, Ben. Thank you. Yes. And, and we have trained before. This presentation was designed around the, the speaker idol process we used to do as well. And we used to train before you do the speaker idols and before you hear them, here's how you should give constructive feedback. Um, I love that you mentioned it to your audience. Do your very best to tell your audience how you would like feedback or what works for you. And asking for feedback is one of the most important things. When we do a big um, conference, the people that don't ask for feedback don't get it. But if you just say the words, can you please leave me feedback or I'll show you one other trick that I'm about to show right here, that that will make all the difference in giving feedback. You'll get more feedback just by asking for it. Um, so excellent points, Ben. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. And here's the thing on feedback. And here's the thing on Q&A. So I left this slide in here for one specific reason to tell you not to do it, <laughs> okay? I don't like Q&A slides like this because it's now I'm going to spend, let's say you did come up with five more questions while we were talking here or something else and you now we're gonna spend 15 minutes looking at this slide. Wow, that's helpful. What if you could spend 15 minutes looking at that slide? That's not only got my contact information, but usually right here, I'll have a QR code that says, leave me feedback at this QR code. So now I've got something to talk to. So don't put a Q&A slide at the end. Please stop this. <laughs> I don't mind if you put up here, Q&A session or anything else like that, or thank you. I really just duplicate my about me slide, but no matter what you do, do not just leave a Q&A slide up there for 20 minutes of talking and say, okay, here's my Q&A time. No, it's not going to help anybody. Leave a good about me slide, okay? Leave something that says, here I am, here's the information. Like I said, if you can have a QR code here with a survey feedback, that works great. This presentation used to have one, but speaker rate killed it, and so I haven't put it back up. Um, the other very important thing to do is to end your presentation. I see this way too often as well. People will go to their Q&A slide and they'll just sit here and talk for 20 more minutes about question and answer. That's great. A lot of people want to hang around and see that, but a lot of people don't feel like they can leave the room or anything because they don't know if the presenter is actually done. So before you start your Q&A, you always say something like this. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciated presenting to you today. I hope you all got something out of this. I am complete with my presentation. I'm more than happy to stay by for a few more questions and answers. But for right now, I'm done. Thank you very much for your time. Wait for applause or something else. And then you can continue on with any Q&A. This way, people know the session is over. It allows everything else to keep running. If somebody has to leave, they go. It's not a problem. They don't have to worry about whether or not you're actually going to talk about something else. So do the right thing and end your session. Okay. It also tells the next presenter that they might be able to get on deck to start getting ready for the next session to come in so that they can get ready and they can be like, okay, he's only going to be up there for five minutes for Q&A because he's ended his session. So, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So as the same thing I just said, 
this is the end of this presentation. The one thing I'm going to add in here that I forgot that I have not really put on these slides is when you are getting your presentation ready, when you are prepping your presentation, always make sure you present to an empty room. Um, the magical number on most presentations for you to kind of memorize and know well is usually about three. So if you're doing it for the first time to some sort of group, try to do it one to two times before that and speak to an empty room. Now, I know this sounds weird and it sounds strange, but when you're trying to figure out your timings of how much content you have and how much time it's going to take you, you have to actually speak. Don't just sit there and flip through your slides and say, I'm going to say this. No, no speak what you're going to say, because it'll make it a much bigger difference. And in your head, it will make more sense. It'll help you memorize it. And it will tell you how long the presentation is going to take because you actually timed yourself doing it. Okay. So I'm, I meant to have this in an earlier slide. It, it's in another version of this and I forgot about it, but please always check your timings and do a presentation to an empty room. After you do the empty room, feel free to present to family, friends, whoever, you know, you might bore them to death if it's something technical, but whatever it is, do the presentation a couple times before you get up on stage to do the full presentation. You'll feel a hundred times more comfortable if you've done it a couple times. If you get up on stage and you've never said your full presentation, I guarantee you'll be more nervous. You'll be a lot more nervous. Whenever I do a keynote, I do a keynote four or five times before I ever walk on stage because keynotes are still very, um, very uh, scary to do on a big stage and stuff. So, okay. With that though, um, I am more than happy to take a few more questions and we've got plenty of time. Um, we still have about 10 or 15 minutes. So, but other than that, I am done with the main presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and see if we have any questions and then I'm going to stop the recording. So we have that going on, but thank you very much. Thank you, Ben and Jessica and everybody that added comments and suggestions into it. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody got a good, good uh, information out of the session. Thank you very much. And I managed to not lose my voice. You did well. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pat. I re yeah, this replacing the Q&A slide, like that makes so much sense. I can't believe, I can't believe I've been using Q&A slides. Uh, I stopped that a couple of years back because I got really sick of watching presentations that were 20 minutes on Q&A. And also I wanted to get feedback. So I would use a speaker rate link here. And I'm like, well, the only way I'm going to get people to look at that is if I Q&A for a while. And so yeah. that's that that worked great. It's brilliant. Yeah. I usually have a thank you slide with my contact information just to make sure that yep. number one, they know that it's the end and, and it's not a Q&A per se. Yep. Um, and then just to make sure they have my contact information if they didn't catch it on the first slide or the Amy slide or, you know, whatever, but yeah, they, people always want to get a hold of you afterwards. It's not common that I've found, but it, it does happen. People do reach out to you afterwards and chat with you. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I recently started adding that at the end, but the QR code with the, like some sort of feedback, because I struggle to get feedback from people. Mm -hmm. I get so little feedback and it's so frustrating because the more I do a repeat on a presentation, I'm like, ah, I've done, I've made this same stupid mistake like four times now and somebody could have just pointed it out to me. And <laughs> yep. so that's a yeah, good idea. There, there was a good system. Speakerrate.com was a great system to do it, but I think LinkedIn dropped it. Um, I, I can't remember now, but I'm pretty sure it's gone because, because I don't know that I can go there anymore and do my account. Um, it used to have the ability for you to kind of, it would give, you could get a URL and then you just put, turn it into a QR code and it would give feedback there on the community and stuff. But I think they dropped it. I'm, I'm, it might still be out there, but I think it's gone. Oh, sad. Um, SlideShare is still there though, but I don't know that, you know what, maybe what I think it is on SlideShare is they stopped allowing you to update your slides. And the problem there is then once you put one up there, basically, if you make any changes, you got to put up a whole brand new one. It's kind of annoying. So but for sure, a Google form or something that you wanted to do for your own feedback would be a piece of cake. And then just put a QR code to it. You could grab all your own feedback that way. No problems. So, okay. Yeah, that's well, probably the easiest way to go is to 
<clears throat> do your own Google form or office form that just lets them feedback. I mean, it's really yeah. easy to do a QR code to that URL and stuff like that, but, yeah. but they, I, I think they just haven't had many people do the speaker ratings thing. I, I don't know why, but it was, I thought it was really good that the, yeah. they had a site like session eyes, you know I mean? Mm-hmm. Session eyes is a good abstract submitter. Why not have a speaker rater? But I, I guess, I guess not. 